Herefordshire is the largest cider producing county in England, with over 8,000 acres of orcharding. The drink itself goes back into Celtic mythology, when the apple was sacred and the apple god was worshipped. It's a big industry, there's no doubt about it. It's a nice industry to be in. I've been lucky enough to be a part of it all my life. We really should be proud of what we're producing in Herefordshire. We've got such a strong heritage and culture of cider making here. That is being reimagined and revitalised with all the new producers that are out there now. It could be the absolute best from somebody who understands the, the fruit that they grow and understands cider making or just has hit on a way of making cider that is sublime. I've been full of joy when I've actually had something that's really, really nice. It's, it's everything. So this is a 2011 vintage, went into bottle mm. in 2012. This all started as an experiment, you see. This, is, this was uh, to see how cider aged on lees. So do you want to know different. what we think of this then? No, not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just pretend you're enjoying it. So does it. Cheers. 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 Cheers, everybody. Yeah. Cider has similarities with WD-40, really. If, if you put some in the right place, it makes things happen. <laughs> it eases up difficult situations. <laughs> Cider making has been so important to the county of Herefordshire. If you take the apple out of the county, you take the history and the economy. Here is a great product made from these iconic apples. And there's nothing more iconic than an apple, for goodness sake, far better than a grape. There's huge potential of what we could do with the apple. So wine from the grape is you know, sold all over the world and you have so many different wines. And we could do the same with, with the apple. Certainly in the last 10 years, uh, cider has come on leaps and bounds. So you've got some really great ciders out and about. It is such an extraordinarily sustainable drink. It doesn't take vast amounts of energy as brewing does for instance. Um, you basically take an apple, you squash it, you don't need to bring heat or cold, you ferment it, the sugars turn into alcohol and you drink it. This is the orchard where it all began. My grandfather, who was past the church over there, was an expert on apples, and especially on Herefordshire apples, and he looked after his orchards very well. His son, Percy, my uncle, decided to follow his father's hobby and his mother's good sense and go into cider making as a business. A year later, his elder brother, my own father, joined him. They started with a stone cider mill on a local farm. Cider was made then basically the same as it is today by grinding up the apples to a pulp and spreading the pulp onto claws, which is then pressed. The old-fashioned way of making cider on the farm was that you simply relied on what turned up, and the fermentation could be either successful or it could be a disaster. 
the process today is almost identical. What has changed is that we now have proper scientific control of the fermentation. Bulmer's growth to be the largest of the English to the southwest cider makers was due to the fact that they'd always put a lot of money and effort into understanding the science of what was going on with the product. Bulmer's gained a better understanding of what was going on in cider making because they investigated it systematically and they were able to build on that. And the other thing they were able to build on was increasing the stability of their products. So that once you'd bottled them up or what have you, they weren't going to start fermenting again in the bottle and cause problems for the consumer. Bulmers were, were a step or two ahead of quite a lot of other people. And that opened up all sorts of markets to them through the interwar years, between the First and Second World Wars. They were exporting to all sorts of places because they knew they were able to package and ship by rail and indeed by sea stable products. One of the other things they could do was to sell cider in bulk. If it's strength you're after, Boomer's Strongbow, strong as your thirst. And the company realised that it, it was short of apples and it needed to do something about it. So they decided that if cider was going to go on increasing in popularity, they would need to do something about growing apples locally. I was promoted to a position where I was joined the side of the business that was trying to encourage growers locally to plant orchards under contract for the company. They came up with a brilliant scheme, they call it their incentive scheme. I went around the farmers and boomers decided that they would pay for everything. The trees, planting, everything, and the farmers would pay back 50% of the resort on upper crop. But in the end, it was 10% they took off. And it was a brilliant scheme because it got the idea of planting up and running. By end of 72, 73, the boomers must have had two and a half thousand acres of their own orchards. It was a very exciting time because you couldn't go out there with a spade planting trees. It had to be done by machine, it had to be marked out by machine. And we used to, up to that time, employ, boomers used to employ something like 200 pickers. And usually they were young mums who'd take their kids to school and then come picking apples, but uh, it was too expensive. Orchards became more intensively planted and machinery was developed and adapted to fit those new orchard plantings and new varieties brought in and that's what really added to the success of everything. Bournemouth has a really, really strong impact lasting today around these orchards. Crucial people like Chris Fairs and John Whirl are kind of revered as world experts in cider apples. And you can't really overemphasize the influence that these people and Bulmers have had over the Herefordshire landscape. Bulmers spent a lot of money on research. They had a research station at uh, the field farm at Hampton Bishop, where all the different combinations of root stocks, planting distances, you name it, was there. It was very, very exciting to work for Boomers, and um, they were the leaders by far, and they led the industry. Bertram Bulmer had always wanted a cider museum 
He travelled around the county speaking to people that either still made cider or had only given it up relatively recently. And this was farm scale cider making. That was partly because Bournemouth had brought up all the medium-sized cider makers. If anybody has another cider making concern that shows any sign of success or has any real growth potential, buy them up, close them down and absorb them into your business. Pay a fair price for apples that they would grow exclusively for you. Uh, and I think those two um, paths were developed very successfully uh, by Bormers. Small scale cider making, it was really in the doldrums. A lot of people had given up. There wasn't a lot of money in it. And it's messy and cold work because it always happens in the autumn. It's always raining and you've got to work with cold, wet apple pomace, you know, it's, you've got to be a hardy person to, to keep that up for not a lot of a return. Some of the smaller and mid-scale cider producers were starting to struggle, but Bulmers were a big company and were doing quite well and they really wanted to consolidate their position. So they saw the opportunity to purchase some of these cider makers, to keep those brands alive, to keep some jobs going as well, and crucially to keep those orchards functioning. I worked here for six years when they were a much smaller company. Uh, and I had to do absolutely everything. If he didn't do it, it didn't get done. After six years here, I went to Bulmers, stayed there 11 years as their head cider maker, and uh, then I had a team of people doing everything for me. We were making hundreds of times more cider than we were here, uh, and obviously making it in a different way. At that point, they were bigger than the second biggest cider maker is today. So they were always a really, really big producer. That's how they operated, a large commercial enterprise. And in those late 1990s and early 2000s periods, you know, it, 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 it were tough times, jobs were lost. It did have an impact. The darkest time for me was in, in the trouble, the money troubles time, um, in the, uh, Early in the two thousand, early two thousand, and on through. A lot of the cider makers and, and apple growers, you know, they're fairly stoic kind of guys and girls, and so they sort of made the best of the opportunities. So when fruit was made available, contracts came to an end or couldn't be continued. Um, there's not much else you can do with cider apples other than you know make cider. So that's precisely what they did. Bournemouth had their financial crisis. They couldn't pay for the contract apples for a few months which made me a little bit anxious because I'd put the whole farm into contract orchards for them. I decided as I was selling out every year, I would jump from 7,000 litres to 20,000 litres. So that's when I started the Ross Cider Company. We know that the home orchard here and the Greg's Pit Orchard, they predate 1785. That's a long cultural history and tradition of orcharding and no doubt cider making. Go 200 yards to the house at the end of the track, there was a cider mill there. Go 50 yards to the east, there was a cider mill there. So every property here had its own mill, its own press. It was almost sort of a mark of a farmer's manhood. I guess I would have been uh, about 31. And my, my dad said, we've got a lovely crop of Kingston Blacks and the old orchard. Why don't we make some cider? I'm a cider maker by chance, because I happened to retire to Line Down Farm, and there was all this funny equipment there. I felt I must try and use it, made some cider, turned out better than expected, and I was hooked, really. Of course, it all took off in the 80s, really. 
and they started at Pershaw College teaching. So I went on a course there. I worked at a college for a number of years, but I've been running my own business now for approaching 14 years. So the main business is training advisory and I run a number of courses. We start them off in a one-gallon demijohn, and well, basically I point out to them, those are one-gallon demijohn, and Mr. Bormas has a 1.6 million imperial gallon demijohn, and it's absolutely no different, other than it's a larger vessel, and you need bigger pumps and things to move it around from. It was when I um, first started to uh, try some cider from a, a local place called Broom Farm, and a chap called Mike Johnson um, really got me sort of interested. And, um, well, I ended up living and working there, in a shed in the garden for a year, and he taught me everything about cider. There are quite a few local cider makers who have started out by coming and talking to me and maybe bringing their apples to me to begin with before they get their presses set up. We came up with the idea that we'd run in enthusiast days. We'd work both ways, you know. They'd spent two hours picking up apples before we got started on cider making. They all had to go at piling apples into the scratter and then making cheeses and tasting it. Probably over the years, I suspect I have trained <laughs> most people actually involved in the cider industry one way or another. Loads of the really skilled makers. I've got photographs of them making their first cheese and things at my place. I think I've got Tom on one photograph and I can remember Norman Stania coming and having a go. James used to bring me his fruit for years until I told him he should be doing his own, really. For the best part of seven, eight years, every year I made my cider and perry with Jean. And then he got his really smart outfit, a bit of a tinny scratter, but, but it's really nice stuff. And of course now he's top of the tree. My interest in uh, cider really grew through my interest in orchards. When 1989 was British Food and Farming Year, I started talking to everybody that I could think of who might have some interest in apples. The only cider makers, actually, in the little group of parishes that we were looking at um, in the Muchmarkle area were Westerns and Jean Noel. When we, we started, we had the, the, the a grisly view of the cider industry tearing itself apart. We did, absolutely. And it was pretty obvious that was not a good way to go and that the good of one cider maker was to the benefit of all the other cider makers. People just started to rally behind the idea and we pulled together very quickly three weekends of lots of little events um, in October 1989 and we called it, very tongue-in-cheek, the Big Apple. Well, we used to meet once a year at Putley for the cider trials. I suppose I had something to do with it. This, today, the, the cider trials here, I think is my favourite day of the year. Oh, lovely. Is that the right thing to say? Yes. We like you too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is the place where it, it comes to life. I first came here when I worked for Mike and got to sort of judge with you and on your behalf and kind of met some people. Um, and then I joined as a committee member and sort of tried to help and facilitate a little bit. Once Upon a Tree wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the Big Apple because I, I'm a relatively late comer to this. Um, and I can't remember if it was 2006 or 2007 was the first one that I came to. And that's what inspired me to go and have a chat with Norman and Anne at Dragon Orchard and start making cider. I literally walked home feeling like I had sponges on the bottom of my feet. And I do remember that very vividly, <laughs> almost floating home thinking, I've got to make cider. If you pick up a glass of cider that's made by somebody that you know um, and whose history you've seen um, emerging in that glass of cider, you're not actually tasting the drink, you're tasting a whole understanding of people and place. I think it's a marvellous organisation now, very useful and in the interests of not only local makers but makers in general really. It's been a wonderful thing. I would describe how cider makers, craft cider makers, work together as co-opetition. 
Um, they, they work to, they're, they're a fantastic example of people who want to share what they do and why they do it. But every farm has got its own style of making cider. We try and make cider actually year very similar to what our father would have made a grandfather and, and so on because I mean that's what real cider is to me. I suppose we were one of the first of what you call the new wave of cider makers. We were slogging away doing nice real cider and everything and then and then the Magnus thing hit. You know we went from farmers almost ringing us and begging us to buy apples off us to almost it, it was gone there, there was no apples out there. I was a big enjoyer of cider and perry and I was feeling that my choice for cider and perry was getting more, smaller and smaller there's less and less people making it and the, the sort of cider and perry I wanted was sort of disappearing and so I thought you know well, perhaps I can have a, a go. My wife, ever observant wife, said, look, there's, there's apples lying around everywhere. And there were. It was a year where Bulmers weren't buying. And so we decided to get some apples and press them. Well, there certainly has been growth. And the industry, but, you know, worked, you know, very hard, you know, hard for that. Over the last 25 years, the curve has been steady and upward. And, and has sort of accelerated, I think. I mean, I think over the last 10 years, it's become really quite steep. Um, and it's just gathered a huge momentum. I think it's about having a plan and having a dream. When I came here, you know, our turnover was about 5 million, now over 60 million. We've got great heritage. Westerns is still on the original site. In 1940s, um, my great uncles were running the business with my father, um, Uncle Stafford and Uncle Leonard. Um, my father was managing director and sort of chairman after when they died and carried on the business. And then he started involving myself and my brothers um, as part of the younger team coming into the business. We used to un unload the lorries when they come late. And also we have to, um, well, a bit short staff in the, in the production, we used to go on the production line. I remember running around the vat sheds and that, again, that smell, it's always the smell of Westerns and you know something special is happening in there. We're proud of the way in which we make our ciders. We still make them traditionally. We press the apples, we put them into these lovely old vats. We're using the same methods, um, great quality fruit, producing great quality ciders. We're commercial cider makers making cider in a traditional way, but we do need to be consistent that's what our customers want. But we have to work with new technology, new ways of doing things, computers, um, doing things more easily really, so we can sell more of it, so it goes further afield and more people can love it. So it's nurture what we've got um, and um, allowing it to carry on for future generations. Basically, I used to walk my dog along the footpath that runs at the end of the, of the orchard here. And I was very taken with the quality of the fruit that was on the trees, the, the look of the apple trees. I didn't know anything about apples really, um, but they just, just look so stunning, so well kept. I'd say that good wines made in the vineyard, I think the same applies with cider. Good cider is made with good apples. I got to know Anna Norman. Uh, we had a couple of meetings, some cider was taken, and uh, in the May the following year, 2008, we officially launched the company with the launch of the ciders, and we entered our three ciders that we had at the time into the International Cider and Perry competition held at Hereford Cider Museum. And we were first in the three categories that we entered. We had an orchard in the farm for um, 59 years in total. The, the orchard was planted the year I was born. And um, over the years, we delivered all the apples that the orchard produced into the commercial cider makers around Herefordshire, mainly Bulmers. And uh, in 2009, uh, we decided that uh, it was time to make our own cider. In the old days, the old boys used to plant a recipe. And so I thought, well, that's, that sounds good. Sheep's nose, woodbine's duckbill, cat's heads, lady's finger, hangdowns, and slack my girdle. 
Names of bittersweet apples that once went into the making of cider. It's got a fantastic name, Slackmar Girdle. They're a pure sweet cider apple. We have got a lot of Yarlington Milk, which is one of my favourite apples. It almost smells like the bubblegum. I like Dabinet. I'm quite a fan of Ellis Bitter. And we've got some of the absolutely fantastic Kingston Blacks as well. Oh, I think it proves in the pudding. I mean, you know, you, I say to people when they come and say to me, oh, I want to plant a little orchard, what do I plant like? Have a look what's in your village, what varieties were there, and plant them, because they obviously work. I'm a fan of any apple that is allowed to grow to full maturity. Uh, has tons of sun, so I prefer the older traditional orchards because I think the fruit makes better cider. We have more orchards here than any other county and uh, we make more cider thanks to Bournemouth Large and in Westerns. But also throughout history Hereford had been where the quality cider came from. We are the major bittersweet cider growing county uh, I say in the world but you know it's true we, 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 grow, a, we grow a tremendous amount of bittersweet. My theory is it's the streak of red clay that runs up through much Markle. The climate, the rainfall is moderate, um, so you haven't got excessive drought in the summer or really excessive rainfall in the winter. To produce cider, you need apples. Apples grow on trees. So you do end up absolutely drinking the landscape. Our history stems from Herefordshire. For us, that history and that heritage and the knowledge and understanding that we've built up all, over all of those years here makes us feel part of the community. And it's really important to us because lots of our colleagues are from the local area um, and many have worked for us for generations. I've been here 21 years and, and seen a lot of changes. And now Heineken's taken over the company now. We've kind of gone back to working for a company that, that have some real values. So from respect, quality and, and, and people, they, they really value the workforce. Cider means a lot for Heineken. It's a global product. We sell it everywhere around the world where we have Heineken uh, sales going on. And so in that sense, uh, bringing it all back here to Hereford, uh, I think being part of Heineken is, is a fantastic chance we have to, uh, yeah, to not only deliver great ciders to, uh, to Hereford, to Herefordshire, to, to UK, but also to, uh, to the rest of the world. I think you help to do a couple of different things. One is that you keep a small industry running in a community, which is, I think, very useful uh, for that community. I think it also allows previous generation to pass on some skills. The general momentum, I think, which is behind cider production of, of the sort that we make and other artisan producers make, I, I don't think that's going to go away. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. We're up to 40,000 gallons now. Um, which is, you know, uh, quite a lot considering we've, 25 years ago we were making like a 10-gallon a barrel, like, you know, for our own use. So we were going to be looking to make around 60 to 70,000 litres of cider this year, and that's in response to demand. 2007 we made 7,000 litres. This year we'll have made 250,000 litres in total of cider. Our export business is a really important thing because when I started um, working here we didn't export. It is now being sold all over the world. So we export to 40 countries. Uh, we've actually got a business in Australia as well. So it's really it's important for the future that we are in the export market. I think we make half a billion pints of cider a year in this county, um, so let's make that a billion. Once we've finished all our building and all our new facilities in place, we'll have the capacity to be able to make 6.5 million hectolitres of cider a year. That's 650 million litres. I think we're seeing more and more diverse ciders, but they've got a massive choice of, of individual local um, artisan ciders today. If more people drink our craft cider, then there's more opportunity for everybody. Mm. Mm. And, and, and not yeah. saying there's anything wrong with commercial ciders, but the craft ciders we make are, are, are a different product. Yeah. And um, we need more people to try them and, yeah. and get used to them. I, I think that the, uh, the more commercial makers, uh, large volume, have 
We, we owe them a great debt, actually. They created the boom that we saw yep. over yep. the last 10, 15 years. They created the market. They gave us the space to make some magic, do something different at a small scale, in our own ways, find a different yep. expression. And we've learned to cherish that, I think. And as a result, the orchards that were once in decline are now being restored and brought back, and that's part of the culture. It was like Laurie Lee said, you know, once tasted, never to be forgotten. It's a childhood memory. So I, I do, I do like it. It's, it's like a somehow it's a link, link to childhood for me, and some other people as well, I think. So we've got the cultural history of place, the people, the fruit varieties. All of that is present. That's a community that has been involved in this for generations, hundreds of years. It was plain obvious we were all having a great time, thoroughly enjoying ourselves. We all just became very good friends, still are.